Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to this evening's stream. Uh, we've got a slightly different and slightly uh, quite special stream uh, this evening. So following on from yesterday's accessibility showcase that we released on YouTube, uh, we've got another sort of stream tonight which is focused around a similar subject. We're going to be showing you how you can make games in Crater and how you can make them um, as accessible as possible. So we've got some special guests and we've got some various things lined up. Uh, so to kick things off, we're just going to play a short clip for you and then we'll be back in a moment. Nobody likes being left out. That's why Special Effect are helping people with physical disabilities to play video games. But this isn't just about having fun. The gaming setups we create are personalized, so people can play to the very best of their abilities. And that opens the door to inclusion and independence, confidence and creativity. Help us level the playing field and create more magical gaming moments because it's everyone's turn to play. Okay, so uh, to take the first part of this stream, I'm going to introduce you to Nat, who's our brand and marketing uh, director. So Nat, if you want to say hi. Hi there. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Yep. Okay, uh, and I guess over to you, Nat. Yeah, so as um, Russ said, we've got some really special guests um, this evening, and hopefully you'll have been as impressed as we always are whenever we see special effects work in action from that video. Um, so we're delighted to work. Um, welcome Becky Frost this evening from Special Effect. Say hi, Becky. Hi, everyone. And also Kirsty McNaught, who hopefully if you've seen our accessibility video yesterday, um, you will have heard, heard her. She is our um, accessibility consultant on the game. Hi there, everyone. Um, so we thought we'd, um, we'd have a little bit of a look at um, accessibility in games. Um, and one of the things we're super passionate about at Unit 2 is making game creation open to absolutely everybody. And that's not just about ages and ability levels and experience, although that's super important too. It's also absolutely about people with all all kinds of different disabilities or challenges or anybody that finds it difficult to engage with this kind of technology um so becky you're the best person to kick off on this front do you want to tell us a little bit more about special effect and all the work that you do to make this kind of thing possible for people i would love to thank you so much um yeah hi uh my name is becky i work for special effect uh i handle the community events and the um, volunteer management side of things at the charity uh, but Special Effect is a UK-based charity who help uh, people with physical disabilities to play video games, uh, in a nutshell. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you do an incredible job at it, too. Um, for well, anybody so that, for, for anybody that wants to um, um, participate in um, helping Special Effect out more, you'll notice that there's just giving link at the bottom of the screen. We're going to leave that up all evening, and it'd be great if, you, if you're able to um, share a few pennies with them to help them out. That would be amazing. Um, so, Becky, it's obviously been quite a difficult time um, for you guys. How have you um, coped with uh, adapting to lockdown and still being able to support people? Um, great question. Uh, yeah, it, it's been it's been quite a challenging time for, for the charity. Um, I, I've got to say, though, I think our um, service delivery teams and, and our, our fundraising team have adapted incredibly well, um, if, if I do say so, <laughs> uh, in, in such a... a short amount of time uh, to a very quickly changing uh, situation but uh, we are very much still open for business uh, with we're, we're taking on new referrals and helping the people that we were previously helping uh, before lockdown uh, through remote calls um, so the team the team who handle uh, what we normally do which is we'd normally go out and visit people in their homes and do an assessment to find out what kind of movement they have, what's stopping them from being able to play the video games that they want to play, and then the team would create a, uh, a setup just for them uh, to kind of help help them to play um, in any way that they can. I'm, I'm so distracted by all the cool stuff that's going on, on the screen right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, the team would, um, would set that up for them, you know, face-to-face -face and, and help get that going. So obviously what we're 
having to do now is rely very much on uh, video calls, Skype, Teams, Zoom, any any way that we can uh, connect with people and uh, sending stuff out to them and uh, talking either them or their carer through the system up and then when lockdown is over and it's safe to do so we'll uh, go back to them uh, and and do sort of in-person visits again and and make sure everything's still set up so it's uh it's been quite a time <laughs> yeah it has <laughs> i think what's brilliant about a lot of the work that you do is that it is it's never just sort of one visit to set up um mm. you know that you you always go back and you adapt things because a lot of the people that you work with have sort of changing conditions and changing needs yes very much so so our our um our service is very much a, a lifelong service we'll never you know set someone up with FIFA 2014 and then say right that's it all right carry on with that for, for the rest of time um uh tasting games change new games come out uh conditions change as you say they they worsen over time or, or better or just, just change over time so yeah we we do repeat visits to people um it's it's it, it <laughs> <laughs> you guys are just amazing <laughs> Um, so, Kirsty, you've, you've um, supported Special Effect for a long time, haven't you? Do you want to give us a little bit of a sense of how you first got involved with them? Yeah, so I used to work in tech and uh, computer vision, robotics, that kind of thing. And I was looking for an opportunity to use those kind of technology skills for something a little more meaningful. And it started out very much as a side project. Um, I got chatting to them a few years ago and they were very keen to look at iGaze technology. And in particular, they had a few people who really wanted to be playing Minecraft. So I worked with them for a while on developing a uh, product called iMine, which lets you play Minecraft uh, using entirely eye control and nothing else. And then that's kind of led on to uh, an ongoing relationship. I've worked on quite a few projects with them um, and to this day. Yeah, the Minecraft thing's astonishing. I think you see the complexity of something like Minecraft and you see how young people engage with it. To then see the same young people doing it just with eye control is just astonishing. So yeah, and it's, it's a really interesting game as well because you can approach it on many different levels. So we have mm. iMind users who use eye control and build really elaborate stuff, kind of <laughs> really expert Minecraft users. And you also have people who maybe struggle a bit with eye gaze and access it on a on a more basic level of just exploring a world independently. Like mm. you get so much value just from being able to run around and find some pigs to kill, um, <laughs> and then you can learn and and adapt and build up your skills over time. Oh, yeah, and, and Becky, you've kind of I know when you you quite often go to um, games events and shows when they're when they're happening. Sadly, not not likely to be anymore this year. Um, but I know I've kind of played a couple of times at your booth that shows um, eye gaze attached to a, a VR yeah. headset. That was an astonishing experience. Can you tell us about some of the stuff you've done in that? Absolutely. I, I, I mine is one of my favorite things to demo. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really fantastic uh, being at an event and seeing one, seeing uh, kids running up to the stand, their faces just lit up because they've seen Minecraft and it's one of their favorite things in the world. And then me to explain what special effect is and what we're here for and and how people can interact with that demo and then like it just sinking in that oh i can play this with my eyes what <laughs> um it's it's amazing i i often like introduce it um to people and sort of say oh yeah a lady called kirsty that that we work with made this she's a wizard because I, I have no idea how you do it kirsty <laughs> I, I can only assume it's some kind of magic um yeah one of one of my absolute favorites to to demo to people and it always opens up that conversation with the the parents as well um which is one of my favorite things about being at these events seeing seeing like parents who are maybe a bit tired from walking around all day with their kids and uh just watching it hit them that like you know this is out here for a reason and mm. and watching them sort of realize how many people this could help that kind of thing it's, it's yeah, a really I think, lovely I think a lot of people don't like you say they don't even think of it as a thing that is a challenge for um less mm. able-bodied people you know people think of all the support for disabled people being just their day-to-day -day functions but actually the entertainment and the engagement in a virtual world sort of seeing people 
engage with that and seeing a disabled person you know being able to fly in a virtual reality eye control thing when mm. they can't even walk in the real world is just yeah. absolutely and i think um you know that as as rubbish as the recent situation has been with with lockdown i think that uh people people realizing how important you know entertainment and gaming and you know being able to access technology is just generally yeah, <laughs> for like, your, yeah. yeah yeah for your well-being um absolutely yeah i think it's um given people a bit of a different perspective on it yeah sure um so obviously one of the things that's been affected um for you as well as like all you know most charities is that the sort of bottoms fallen out of your kind of summer fundraising activities there's always a ton of people that do you know marathons and 10ks and mm -hmm. and all sorts of bits and pieces that are now all cancelled so um how are how are you and your supporters adapting um ag again like so so proud <laughs> to to see uh the amazing stuff that a lot of our supporters are coming out with um one of our big um sort of summer fundraisers would have been the uh, london 10k the mm -hmm. british 10k um which unfortunately has been uh cancelled now uh but we've set that up as a virtual 10k um so people can you know run in their neighborhood run in their home uh we had a chap in a powered wheelchair do uh several laps of his front hall um Amazing. just up and down and complete a 5k that way so there's so many like little things going on um one, one of my colleagues, Tom, did the 2.6 uh, challenge. Uh, did a load of like physical challenges dressed as a duck. I was um, going to say he was wearing an interesting costume through all those, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. He just had the duck costume. That was a that was a thing that, that he had. Um, someone else, uh, oh, I forgot their name. Hang on, let me find their name. Elaine. Uh, there was a lady called Elaine who was going to be doing a, uh, a rat race dirty weekend obstacle race um and that was cancelled so she set up the obstacles like all the equivalent of in her back garden <laughs> and and did the whole thing anyway um yeah so there's there's so much stuff going on um i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna forget some people but <laughs> so how can people watching um support you during these times in particular uh well i mean if if people are able to uh as you said just earlier there's the you're just giving link um uh, which is justgiving.com forward slash special effect, which is on the screen right now, I believe. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, if, if people can donate in that way, if people want to get involved with the um, virtual 10K that we're doing, you can head to the website, um, which you've probably got on screen as well, but is uh, specialeffect.org.uk. And yeah, there's, there's a tab called Get Involved, which will have all of our current events on that people can get involved with I'd, yeah i'd really urge everybody to um to check out what these guys are doing you know as as becky said we're all we're all really beginning to appreciate the the need for entertainment and relaxation and escaping into virtual worlds more than ever right now and so yeah anything you can do to help support even if it's just a retweet um i should probably declare an interest that i'm also a special effect ambassador so i will wax lyrical about how amazing <laughs> they are from now until the end of time but um hopefully we can do our part within crater um to enable more people to play and also hopefully ultimately enable more people to get involved in the creation experience as well and we can perhaps talk about that um more with Kirsty in a bit um, Absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, we do have people who are doing like gaming marathons. Uh, there's a, a group called the Gaming for Others. Um, the, a group called Gaming for Others who did a, a marathon over Easter for us. And I think they raised over a grand. It's, it's just like, so if you wanted to, you know, the people at home wanted to set up a fundraiser where they do, I don't know, 12 hours of game creation in Crater or a, a Crater <laughs> game jam or, you know, it's, there's, there's so many different options. Uh, Sounds to like a time plan. <laughs> so, Kirsty, let's let's dig into it a little bit to talk about the kind of things that people creating games should consider. So, it's very easy to kind of say, "Oh, make things more accessible." But what does what does that actually look like in reality? Yeah, so there's there's a whole host of things you can do, and depending what kind of disabilities you're designing for, that can obviously be very varied. But a good kind of high level perspective is to think about the information that your game is giving to a player and whether that's going to be accessible to all people so think about whether 
maybe there's some sound effects in your game that give the player hints about something dangerous that's happening can you accompany that with visual hints or if there's some visual information in the game maybe you could have some some audio effect or some vibration or something some other sensory modality so that so that all bases are covered if somebody's got a visual impairment or is deaf um, they can get the information they need to participate in the game fully and the other thing is to think about controls um, so a lot of the work i've done has been adapting games for people with motor disabilities so where the controls might be a bit limited you can't use all of the inputs on a controller perfectly all of the time for instance and in that case sometimes a game might be designed with an unnecessary variety of controls or with certain gestures that are hard but don't need to be so for instance maybe you need rapid uh, combo button presses to get past a certain area in the game and that's an unnecessary barrier for somebody who might suffer pain or, or have limited mobility in their fingers um, or maybe you can reduce the number of controls that are required um, so use the same control for different things in different contexts um, or just make things a bit more forgiving so you don't have to be very accurate with pointer control um, so what the guys are playing in the background is Create a Sprint League, um, which is another one of our launch titles that one of our indie fund developers created. Um, and the showcase for that actually went live a couple of hours ago, so you can check that out afterwards. Um, but do you want to talk us through some of the accessibility work that the, the self and the developer did in that game in particular? Yeah, so um, the original scope for the game um, that Johnny, who built it, came up with was that he wanted it to be accessible on lots of levels. So to be able to play it with a full controller if you can, and then to be kind of progressively reduced controls and still be able to participate. So the game's an obstacle course. Um, you run around, you, you race your best time. If, you, um, if you're playing with default controls, you're just using two thumbsticks and a jump button and, and everything's as you might expect. If you want, if you can maybe only access one joystick at a time, um, and one button, which is quite a common setup for the kind of people that special effect works with. Then it's got auto run functionality, so you can you can just turn on running, toggle it, and now you're going to be running forward and you'll steer and jump. And then um, this extends even further down to a single button mode where uh, there is automatic steering that you can enable in the game, so it will steer you around the world. All you need to do if you've also got auto run turned on is time your jumps. And if you miss a jump and you fall down, then you're going to fall into some kind of backup path that's a bit slower. So you can always get where you want to go, um, but it's a challenge on, on timing rather than, rather than steering. On the surface, sounds kind of quite complicated technically, but um, it's actually simpler than it might, might appear, is it? Isn't it? How did you actually go about... Um sorting that out within Creator itself? So um, it's all, all of the auto stereo functionalities uh, using the Lua API. Um, so there's uh, an option in the API to override the player movement and looking directions. Um, it is, for steering it is actually quite complicated to quite a difficult problem to steer the player towards something but still have all of the natural dynamics of, of running and jumping and you can't just teleport them to the point the place that you want them to be um but uh with a few algorithms from robotics uh, the kind of thing you'd use to steer a car you can code that all up in lua and um it it works quite well and it's quite e it was quite easy to kind of add that in because of the flexibility of the, of the Lua API. No, it's, it's worked really, really well. Uh, what kind of things are you looking forward to seeing creators experiment with on this side of things when creators live? So I'm really keen to see some other ideas for limited controls. So totally different games with, with one switch. That's a really nice kind of... Uh, goal as a, as a kind of challenge for, for a creator to come up with like what can you design that's totally different that has really varied and interesting gameplay but uses only a single input or maybe a joystick and a single button um, and also to, to look at people explore using different sounds and different visual effects um, to kind of have immersive experiences. 
And we did talk on the on the video, but I think it's worth it's worth mentioning here as well that you weren't just looking at kind of in game stuff; you were looking at kind of general experience stuff from an accessibility standpoint within Creator. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, at Unit Two, we're really keen that the game creation experience is accessible, not just game play. And obviously, that's the bit we have more control of because we we don't know what people are going to build in Creator. <laughs> um, so we've implemented a few things within game to make sure, for instance, um, if you're using the editor to do advanced editing in the game, um, it's very adaptive for scaling the UI. So uh, you, can, you can make the text really big if you're coding or, or get bigger icons. Um, the controls for both playing and editing, because it's, it's all kind of the same engine, the controls are very um, flexible in terms of remapping. So you can set it up to whatever your uh, your requirements are um and there's a few other options that, that we might we might show later in the in the stream yeah russ adam do you want to maybe kind of jump into the the game now so those of us yep. those of you that joined us on tuesday night um you will see that the guys um built an initial game and we're actually going to take that game now and kirsty's gonna um advise russ and adam on actually what things can be adapted live in that game to make it more accessible um, in the meantime, though, we're going to have to say goodbye to Becky. Sadly, she's got to got to head off. But thank you so much, Becky, for joining us. Especially, oh, thank Friday you night. so much for having me. No worries at all. I, I know Friday nights are meaningless during lockdown, but we appreciate you joining us anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have time anymore. Um, <laughs> exactly. no, this this is the this is the interesting part of the stream, like the 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 part where you know uh, Kirsty can like advise on the actual things that you can sort of tweak and change to to make a game more accessible like i'm really interested to to see this part so i will be watching in the background don't worry <laughs> no worries. so yeah thanks very much for joining us and I'll, I'll drop out now and see everybody else in the chat and i look forward to seeing what you guys come up with okay. back over to you Rob. brilliant okay thank you very much Bye. becky thanks nat Bye. um okay yes yeah, so that's super interesting i was just like running through the the game just really sort of um really interested in everything that was being said so yeah that's um the really great stuff so as nat said we're going to jump in now to the game that we made on tuesday um our sort of quick puzzle game um, i think Kirsty's just going to give us some pointers and just talk us through various things that we can do try and um sort of bring it up to a slightly more accessible um sort of gameplay style so uh, perhaps what might make sense first is if we just do a quick preview for three of us and, and maybe sort of talk through your thoughts Kirsty, as we play along and then we can come back and try and fix some of those things yeah, sounds good. Okay, so I'm just going to press uh, F5 now, and we'll go into the uh, preview mode. So, yeah, if you'd like to just talk us through um, sort of your first thoughts in this initial area. Yeah, so um, here uh, you play it through. So you've got to press that button, haven't you? And then you've got to pick up a thing and move it along. So this is a good opportunity to talk about controls. Um, firstly, it would be kind of nice to have some prompts that, that tell us what the controls are. Mm -hmm. um, I think, is it A to interact? Uh, I think it's X, oh, X. on yeah. a controller, yes. I, I play on PC normally. <laughs> um, so to get that to spawn, I had to press quite a small target, and uh, my thumbs aren't particularly great with the controller because I play on PC. Um, if there was any way we could kind of make that a bit more forgiving, um so with some kind of trigger volume or something um that would be nice so i don't have to get super close and accurate yeah okay. um and then how do i pick this up is it trigger yes yeah so you have to hold down the trigger to keep okay. it picked up so i hold that down and i so at this point i'm having to both hold down a control but also use my other controls to walk um, so some people would find this quite difficult, um, either if they're using kind of the same hand for different controls and can't do them simultaneously, or if just holding down a control is, is painful or difficult. Um, so if there was any way that could just be a toggle, I think the gameplay would be exactly the same, but you'd just click to hold and then click to let go. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, that should be straightforward enough. I could have a look at that. Yep. Um, I noticed the um, lights on the door, uh, it was red and then it went green. That kind of uh, is something that uh, I immediately think, oh, red, green, that's a colorblind issue. Um, some people won't be able to tell the difference between red and green there. But in this case, you've got a door opening and you've got audio effects. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, if you've got information in one form, as long as you're uh, backing it up with information in other forms, then then that's okay. So that's not 
a concern in this case, but something to, to kind right. of Right, okay. Of. Yeah. yeah, so if that light was by itself in isolation and was telling you something somewhere else in the level had opened, but you couldn't actually yeah. see the door, that would probably be a problem at that point. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And and maybe in that case, um, you could try different colours, but it's always difficult to find colours alone that work for everyone. Um, so maybe you could think about like, a, a, a slight flicker on the light when it's green or, or something that's or a bigger radius when it changes just something else other than color and okay. information um so what have we got here i've got to get that with my thumb control uh, i've got to put that okay so i've picked up a blue block and i've got to put it on a blue thing here yep and again, think about color here. Um, blue and red aren't a terrible combination, so I think that is okay for many forms of color blindness. But it's this, a very similar color, like the same kind of uh, saturation or darkness. Um, okay. I had a quick look at this earlier, just in grayscale, uh, which is a good kind of proxy for take away all color information, um, and you can't tell the difference. So, right, okay. Maybe if there's any way we can make these distinct in a different way, that, that would be nice. So that could be perhaps altering like, the shape of them slightly or giving them actual a visual difference rather than just relying on that color difference. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Yeah, that, that should be straightforward enough. Uh, you guys need to help me press these buttons. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> We're just kind of watching you go through. <laughs> Okay. okay, Kirsty, we get it. They're too small. <laughs> <laughs> okay. it's, it's always helpful for me that I normally play on PC. So when, when I hold the controller in my hand, it's a good simulation of uh, slightly reduced controls. Right, so, yeah, I see. My excuse anyway. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm much more a controller person. So I, yeah, I always default to that. Um, oh, wait, sorry, someone's already done that. Cool. Ah, uh, uh, no, so here... The idea is we have oh, to put, yeah, put this cube put through the door. Yeah. Okay, which again, I guess yeah. is okay, given that the light's changing, but we see the door changing, going up and down at the same time. So yeah, we, exactly. So that kind of works out. Yeah. Um, um, are you leaving me to do it? Uh, no, okay. I'll come and do it. Okay. <laughs> nice. Okay, so something here that isn't a serious problem but just something that kind of comes to mind is this is the one bit of the level where maybe you think you might need to jump up um if say you'd put the block really far at the like back over here on uh, at the end of the window okay and you were playing with limited controls in terms of a joystick you might struggle to kind of get your your crosshair over it um again in this case i think it's fine um but I've seen quite a few games sometimes where there's just one bit of the map that you can't get to unless you jump, but jumping isn't necessary in other any other situation. So just okay. think about what controls are that you need. Yeah, so some little steps on that perhaps, or just something like that might help yeah. eradicate yeah. that issue entirely. Okay. Exactly. Um, and it's it's not a, a comp in this case. Not many people are gonna be in that situation, but you might as well get rid of that barrier in case some people are. Yep. Okay. Yep. And I think, yeah, we've got kind of similar mechanics here just with yep. this new sort of cool. slightly more technical uh, logic gates placed in. Is there anything? Are we doing any visual interpretation of those logic gates if there were other ones? I think it's just it gets lit up and that is bright. Yeah, I think. So you made uh there's a um a knot gate isn't there as well adam i think you made that look slightly different but again it's not a huge difference yeah on tuesday stream we didn't quite get time to fit that in whoops i've just knocked the block off um i didn't quite get time to fit in the knot gate as well um but it looks quite similar so i think one important thing would be clearly giving them some visual differentiation so that you can very clearly see which one's an and gate and which one's a knot gate yeah yeah that's that sounds good Okay, cool. And then just a little party room at the end I made earlier just to wrap it up. Uh, and again, just spawns various things to, to sort of play with and throw around. But yeah, that brings us to the end of that. So, okay, cool. So we've probably, let's jump back to the uh, 
editor side of it now and we'll perhaps start putting some of those things to action um the first thing i think i might take a look at is getting the gun to work on that sort of toggle as you said oh uh, yeah yeah that would be good yeah adam which bits would you like to look at so i know it was a smaller point but i think i'm going to start adding some steps into that point where we have to jump so that jumping isn't needed okay. in fact I think I'll turn off jumping on players entirely so that no one feels like they've got any sort of different controls because jumping is not necessary for this game. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that should work. Um, cool. So what I'll do is I will open the uh, physics gun script and have a little look at this. So I don't know if you want to join me in this script, Kirsty. Come and have a little uh, look. Yep. I'll jump in. So first thing I'll do here is just try and make this look a little bit, uh, a little bit bigger. So again, I guess that's one of the sort of accessibility things you'd mentioned was about sort of making the sort of the code editor size perhaps a little bigger, so you can get the, the sort of slightly larger font for people who are perhaps sort of visually impaired. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Um, so yeah, you can both scroll, uh, zoom in just in the editor itself but you can also scale the ui all around if you need that as well cool okay so the weapon the way it currently works is we have to hold down a trigger and so your notes are you think it'd be better if it was a perhaps i could move it to a button press instead so one of the face buttons on the controller so perhaps the b button um and then also make it so it toggles um so that kind of completely removes the need to use a trigger at all um yeah. if that helps i think it would be all right if if it was a trigger with a toggle a toggle um okay because players can can adapt their controls as well they could swap out if they wanted face buttons instead that would be okay okay um, sure um so what i can do is in this script we've got a couple of entry points for on press and on released so all i should really need to do is just move this logic from the uh, on release part where we say when we release the secondary action to drop the item, um, it should just be a check here for if I've got an item, I'm going to drop it. If not, I'm going to try and collect it. So yeah, straightforward if statement. So if self collection item, so the collection item is one of my variables where I store the thing that I'm holding. Uh, if that's not equal to nil, then I should be able to just say drop item. Otherwise, try and collect it. So that should uh, work. And then, yeah, we could then just. And then just remove everything. And probably just remove all of that. Yeah, that's kind of uh, obsolete now. So, okay, that should be good to go uh, with the, um, the toggle now. So that's one thing, nice, quick, and easy uh what should we have a look at next have you done your stairs there adam yep i've done the stairs and one other thing i've done kirsty mentioned the red and green lights to signify if a door's locked or unlocked um so i've changed that to a pink and blue instead where pink is closed and blue is open which i think is a little bit better for any colorblind players cool that sounds good okay uh let's next have a look at the uh the pads um that you mentioned so in this next room along we've got the sort of the first case where we've got the red and the blue pads next to each other um yeah. i guess going for any other two color combination might slightly improve it but we still would end up with the same problem in some cases so you yeah, exactly. so you recommend what might be better here is to actually sort of change the, the actual visual uh look of it and then maybe try and reflect that on the boxes somehow yeah so you could go for some kind of textured voxel instead or some kind of different shape like he suggested um, the difficulty with color blindness is that there are several different types of color blindness and depending what you have you'll be missing different parts of the color spectrum so you'll have different clashes of colors right um, so if you start trying to find certain color combinations that will work for everyone you can get reasonably far but uh some people won't see color at all um and once you've got beyond a couple of combinations of colors it starts to get really tricky so it's always nice to just kind of add textures 
in the um, in Crater in the store, when you get items, they have a rarity color um, or a tag that describes how rare they are. And we've got there, we've got uh, colors with text with um, different patterns on it, like stripes versus stars, that kind of thing, just to have a different source of information. Okay, yes. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, that's one of the, the areas where we've actually, you know, in the development of Crater, we've kind of got to the point where we thought, you know, how even those finer details, like how can we make all of those as accessible as possible as well? Uh, which is really, you know, it's really good stuff. Um, so if I, for example, if I pick this carpet, I've never actually found a use for this carpet before, <laughs> but um, I feel like I might actually have found a good use okay. for that. So can you guys see that back in the main game has now changed to the carpet on that pad? Yep. 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 Okay, so is that a good example, as you say? So that sort of textured pattern. Um, yep. So you you wouldn't need any colour information to tell the difference between that and the red one. Cool. So what I'd need to now do is also change the, the sort of cube you pick up itself yeah. to match that. Um, okay, so that should do. So if we just hop back into preview now, we should find that those little things have started to improve. So I'll just do that quickly. And while that loads, I should probably just mention for any eagle-eyed viewers that we have made some slight improvements from tuesday stream because at the end of tuesday stream we ended up hooking up some of the logic a bit wrong which was very much a user yeah. error <laughs> so we yeah. have actually fixed the last room and got the sort of party room thing at the end that was showed cool okay yeah, this is nice. yeah so i guess just for the for the for the viewer um if i just tap l2 now i've actually picked this up and i'm not needing to hold it and that's now sort of attached to the end of the weapon and then i just press l2 again and it'll drop it so yeah, as you say, that kind of allows people um, to not have to hold the button and move and perhaps jump and all those things. They can kind of focus on one control at a time. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and then yeah, straight away here we can see obviously the the pad on the right. No matter what sort of, um, sort of color blindness you may have, you can see straight away that that these two things are very different and that the the, the cube itself reflects that. So. Hey, that's the first time I've used the uh, the carpet box wall in a in a practical manner. So <laughs> very good. Um, Adam's lights have changed as well, so they've hopefully we'll see the the difference there with them. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And then you said you changed the stairs as well. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> you get oh, man. <laughs> Kirsty. <laughs> I tripped over it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... Yeah, do you want to just help me out? <laughs> yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> Don't trip over it. <laughs> cool. Okay, while well, you guys catch up, so I can see, yeah, so you've added these steps here. So again, there's no need for me to jump. And actually, you, you've you removed the jump option because it's oh, cool. yeah. something we don't need, but that just allows us to get up to here for if we ever can't reach that, that box. So mm -hmm. excellent. Okay, well, I think that should cover most of the things that we've done so far. Um, so I'm going to go back to editor so next we might want to have a look at the prompts and also the um the size of the bot uh, the size of the triggers um do you want to have a look at the triggers around the buttons adam and i'll have a look at yep, the prompts in okay so using the community tab which is something we covered in the last stream uh, we're actually able to uh, take um, a package that exists um, as a creator sort of built-in package that you can use uh, which is our prompts package and you'll notice a few things the editor has sort of very similar prompts which are contextual uh, to the actions you're doing um, and we can actually include that sort of stuff in our games as well so i can go to the community tab and search for prompts uh, and the description here is standard on-screen prompts for controls and what you can inter what you can interact with and use in your inventory i'm just going to install this so because i've used the inventory package uh, which again is sort of a built-in creator one um, this should sort of plug in quite nicely, but there's no reason why you couldn't have your own uh, custom written inventory and still plug this in or write your, you know, entirely write your own prompts package. This is just one way that you can quickly get them in uh, for yourself. So what we should do now is go to our templates. I'm just going to go to my uh, user. Right. I'm going to stick it on the player. So. On this player uh, template, so again, uh, from the last stream, you might remember that we have uh, user and player templates, which 
the user is kind of the the account that's attached to the game uh, the player is the physical player in the game so we, sometimes we'd want to attach certain ui uh, specific to the player uh, in this case i'm going to look for the in fact i'm going to go back to the packages and probably sitting just behind me on the stream um but there's a uh player prompts here that i can just drag onto the player and then we get all these different options and i'm just going to take a quick look at this script um and you can see it comes with all this different all this sort of predetermined logic and what that's going to do um is give us uh, the prompts that appear on screen um so it will build up a sort of a, a lower table of different prompts and then we can have certain entities within the world uh, advise that bit of ui as to what is going to happen so that's where we can build in the sort of contextual uh, side of things so for that i'm going to need to go to my physics gun script again and what i'll need to do is just add in a new uh, function which is kind of like a helper so that um prompt script will reach into this and say okay uh what you know what kind of controls is this thing that the player's equipped uh, got and what kind of things kind of contextual to the moment can it do so let's have a look so function physics gun script and i think it's get button prompts and that passes the table of prompts the one thing we can do here in lua is um actually pass in this table and then update the table from this function and not necessarily need to pass the table back uh, we kind of pass it by reference and, and update the prompts there uh, so i know that this prompt has um an x uh, sort of the secondary control so we can see here on the right hand side the secondary instruction uh, we could hard code it here so we could say you know this is always what this control will do but obviously now we've made this toggle this control will either collect or it will drop. So we have to kind of um, account for that. Uh, but let's just, we'll do the sort of straightforward example first. So we'll say prompts dot secondary equals, so the prompt itself. So we're gonna get this from a property. So we'll write that in a second. So we'll say self.properties um, collection message. Okay, and then we'll just need to come up to our properties here at the top of the script and write what that will be. So say select a collection message. And that will be of type text. Okay, so if we now go to our physics gun template and scroll down. Here we've got this new option that's appeared um, in the properties window for the collection message and we'll just call that collect item okay i think I need to also add this here on the user so we see that these prompts now appear on screen um these are the things that are gonna sort of the uh, the, the way we'll see them and these will all contextually change depending on what's going on uh how are you getting on adam with your uh trigger boxes yeah pretty good um it should work we'll try and test it in the game but i've also added a little bit of animation to the button which would be quite subtle but just so you can see it push down when you interact with it for a bit more feedback to the player okay nice We're looking at adding a subtle effect to it as well so there's a bit more visual feedback Okay. I think it already plays a sound, so there's already a bit of audible feedback, but I'll check that as well. Okay, cool. And that um, that animation is one of the, the built-in animations, is it? Yeah, so if you just look at the button mesh, you can see it has a couple of animations built in. And you literally just call self get entity play animation and you pass the string of the animation name. Cool. Okay, yeah, so I can see it's got a deactivate and an activate. So yeah, okay, nice. Okay, let's give this a go. So hopefully I've done all that correct. If not, I have to go see why not. Okay, so I'm not seeing my message. So obviously just made a little mistake there, but we'll see how uh, well yours works. So uh, it doesn't. <laughs> okay, I can see the, the small bit of feedback on the button though as, it, as it's being depressed. If I try that in first person, you might see that. 
So yeah, we should see that button dip up and down, uh, which helps. It's quite nice. Um, mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, let's just jump back. Look at what's going sure. on there. I think the trigger the triggers aren't interactable, and I wasn't sure. So I'll maybe change that for a bigger mesh or a voxel mesh or something, so we can adjust the exact shape and size. Okay. Ah, got my function name wrong, so that's probably why that didn't work. Okay, so let me know when you're ready and we'll try that again. Uh, yeah, two seconds. Well, two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Tell you what, so what I'll do while Adam's just sorting that out is I'll write the next little bit of logic here. So, as I said, these things are... Um, the way that they work is it's kind of contextual. So in this function, I'm actually saying um, kind of based on kind of the current situation, what is the control? So similar to how I checked uh, before as to whether I can sort of drop or collect the item, um, I can do a similar thing here. So if, see what I might just do, I might set up a property for this. This will work a bit nicer. So. I'll uh, we'll set a property that uh, has item, okay, and that is of type boolean. And then one thing I can do here is actually set this to not be editable. So this is a property that won't actually appear on the front end, but instead it's something that the script can remember um, itself in its properties, and we can use that on either the client or the server. So if I was to say if self dot properties has item, then prompt dot secondary equals a drop message otherwise we want it to display the collect message okay so i'm just going to write that here drop message Okay, right. So then we'll come down to our other functions. So we want to say now, when we drop an item, let's set that we don't have one. And when we collect an item, let's set that we do have one. Okay, all right, nothing like a little bit of live coding. Um, Okay, is there anything else that we've forgotten to cover there, do you think, uh, Kirsty, or are we kind of on top of it at the moment? I think we're on top of it. It's looking good. Cool. Cool, I'm ready to go when you are, Russ. Okay, see if that works. Okay, still not seeing my prompt. I can take a look at the prompt. Uh, yeah, with you, see what cool. see what I've done wrong there. That's it. Did work earlier. Okay. Is the trigger button working, Adam? I yeah. Can't tell because we're all triggering. I was going to say I think we're all pressing it. How does it feel to you, Adam? I think it's still just triggering on the button itself, so I'll have to check that. Okay. Cool. But I think, and again, this is kind of credit to, you know, the way that you can develop in Creator is the, the iteration speed, you know, jumping in, jumping back out, doing these things. It's um, it's sort of, it's a nice, quick way to, to sort of get instant feedback. So let's have one more shot. Um, so you had a trigger box originally that was uh, set to interactable and did it pass the event through? So I don't think it passed the event through, but what we could do is try doing a print statement in the button script just to check when it's being called. Sure. Uh, so if you want to open up the button script. Okay, yeah, so I can see you can press. So there we go. We'll just print out which player has pressed it once we get a press. So if you look under button, I've created a child called button area. And you'll see that ha that's got an on interact, um, which sends a message up to the button script using the event system okay. to call on interact on there. 
And um, what um, what is the button area? Is that so the button area is an invisible voxel mesh, so that I could change the size and shape of it nice and easily. Okay. So if you just there we oh, go. Oh, I see. Right. So that should be what we're interacting with. Yeah. So it didn't seem to be working. Uh, I'm just wondering if maybe interaction doesn't get called if something's invisible. Yeah, potentially. So uh, which could be the case. Yeah, I think you'd be, you'd be better off with the trigger box, as we said there. Um, might be might be one thing there um again again you know the beauty of of game development is there's so many different ways to achieve uh, different things it's just all about diving in and learning what uh, what works best so i'm going to remove that original prompt override from the player in case that was getting in the way so have a look here Okay, so we can see the prompts there, so we should get those to come in uh, just fine. Let me just check. So secondary is the name. So prompts.secondary, drop and collection message. Ah, so one thing I did forget to do before was actually set the drop message. So again, in my properties here, we'll just say, drop item another thing we could do if we had a little bit more time would be to actually get the name of the thing we're holding um and sort of format that in uh, so we'll see if we have time for that as well right um so i think yeah a, bit, a bigger trigger box would work on that but um we'll just see if we have time uh, or a bigger mesh itself so as you mm -hmm. see you've gone for a lever so, here instead of that so those little buttons might uh, work in some cases for certain things, but actually switching it to just one of our other meshes as a, you know, the much bigger lever, which comes with its own much bigger collision. That's actually a really nice way of doing it. So once you're ready yeah, with that, Adam. We have a last minute fix just to make sure we can get a better solution on the stream. But yeah. That sounds good to me. That should sounds work. Good. And it will be a lot more visually obvious as well than the tiny little button um, yeah. that sort of pushes down slightly. So we'll give that a go, I think. Okay, right. Let's see if we get any further this time. Yay, that looks okay. a bit better, actually. Yeah, so we've got sort of yeah, a much bigger area to interact with there, which is good. One thing I was thinking, Russ, that you actually mentioned earlier, but I maybe missed the point on. So here we're using um, interact. We're using face button for the lever. Okay. And then we're using a trigger for the picking up items. We, yep. There's never any ambiguity over which of those controls should be used. They're two different contexts in the game. So you could use the same control for both of them, either the trigger for both or the, or the interact button for both of them. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I guess that you know we could, um, we could change the boxes to sort of be picked up on interact. Um, might take a little bit more sort of work um, than perhaps I can think of off the top of my head right now. But yeah, so as you said, I guess combining controls to be sort of under the same uh, button is quite a nice way of of making sure that you know if someone was only able to um, to use one button, you know, the more controls that come under that, the better. Yeah, so I've been playing um, the last couple of times we've previewed. I've set my joysticks up so that I'm mainly only using one joystick. So I've mapped the axes to the left joystick for walking forward and rotating. So that's like a legacy mode or tank mode. Okay. And all, all I need to do at the beginning is, is to kind of look down slightly so that my crosshair is at a reasonable place for interacting with things. And then the rest of the game I can play with the joystick and... At the moment, it's two buttons. So if we had one button for both actions, it would be a one joystick plus one button game, which would be really nice. Okay. Well, let's just jump back, actually, because that might be quite a quick thing I could do. Uh, Adam, do you, do you want to have a quick look at these prompts and just see why they're not sure, yeah. showing up? Yeah, I've got them on the user. Um, just double check that for me. Makes and you've, you've got sense. them on the player as well. I, haven't, I did have them on the player, and I removed it from there in case I'd got it a bit mixed up. Um, but okay, okay. what I should be able to do is here where we have um, on press and we're passing the button, that's actually coming from a script on uh, the player, um, sort of the inventory view side of things. So it's the built-in package. 
So I believe one of the things that this would pass is interact um, as a action. Let me just see if I can double check that. Because that, as you say, that'd be a really nice way of making sure that the sort of yeah, the, the fewer controls we need to use, the better. Okay, so that yeah, it comes from here. So this is actually an entry point in the API. So when a button is pressed, this is called kind of by the creator API. And then all we're doing here is passing whatever that button was to the held entity of the player. So in this case, it's the physics gun itself. So that should get called. Um, I know one th another one we could maybe add just in case it's not is on interact. Uh, we're probably going to play interact with entity. That's actually, uh, in fact, no, that's not right because that's that's what you call on the thing you interact with. So, okay, let's see what gets passed through here. And again, I can use the console like Adam did before to just double check what this is. So, um, let's just say inventory view on button pressed, and then we can output to the console what the button is. So, but I believe it could just be interact so if we just change that string there to literally be interact it should fire the same logic off when the interact button is pressed uh, any ideas adam uh i've been struggling to follow all the stuff you've been saying about what gets called <laughs> where, to be honest <laughs> that's okay um right so we've got our prompt script here i did have this working earlier we'll give it one more go but if not you know we, we kind of get the idea that there is a um a package here to be used and we can see what those prompts or um, I think it could be to do with the, the physics gun itself being quite an old uh, script, but we send. I just want to check. You do have somewhere where you call the get button prompts from the physics script, yeah? Yes. Physics gun script. Yeah. Okay. So get yep. button prompts. So I'm just looking here at where that's called, and we say inventory view script properties held entity then to scripts. So I'm wondering if my yeah, so I think the version of the inventory view script I'm using is a little bit older. I see. Mm. Russ, I think for uh, button prompts without context, can we just add the text into the properties of the user prompts view? Well, we probably could, actually. Yeah, that would. Yeah, we could try that. So um, it doesn't give the context of what no, you're holding. No, no, that's it right. Demonstrates the. It's the next best thing. Yeah, yeah, it is. So we've just moved it to interact, so it should be here. We just say, uh, let's do collect slash drop item. Okay, cool. So let's... Actually, the, the, this is a slight pain because I just told you to use the same button <laughs> yes, two yeah. things in two different contexts. No, I see. Yeah, yeah. But obviously, we'd, yeah, we'd given the context, we could get it to, to flow a bit nicer. Yeah. Um, okay, let's. Have a look and see if that gives us what we want. There we go. So we should see at the bottom now that we have the press X to collect slash drop item. Um, so now I can press that. So yeah, and I think I realized, yeah, the physics guns on a slightly older uh, version of the inventory view script. So there'll be a little bit more hooking up there to do, but we get the idea as I say, we can drop in these um, UI packages and just start to play with them. However, we've got our inventory set up. Uh, can I also say yeah. a nice thing about that package is that you know it's saying press X to collect drop item, but if I had remapped X to one of the triggers because I found the triggers easier, then it would say press left trigger. So it would it would take the control remappings for the particular user. Yeah, and that's yeah that's really nice, um, really nice easy way of doing it. But also it will kind of dynamically switch between keyboard and mouse as soon as I pick up or start moving my mouse or sort of on a keypad we see that it now says press e to collect because e is the interact key on a keyboard but as soon as i go back to my controller i get the x um, icon for the controller so you know sort of dynamically jumps between the two which again is just a nice touch just for people um you know who might you know you have someone comes to help you with something um the all the on-screen prompts will kind of move to their uh, preferred control scheme which is quite nice um, okay, yeah, so I think we've we've kind of made a few changes there pretty quickly. Um, I think, yeah, with a little bit more time and a little bit more work, we get some of these prompts to be a bit more uh, dynamic and give the player even more 
uh, feedback. So was there anything else you thought of there, Kirsty, or do you think we've, we've just about solved it now? We've probably covered all the things we've talked about. Excellent. Okay. All right, then. Well, I think that's probably a good place to start uh, wrapping this up. So thank you once again, uh, Kirsty. That's been a really useful insight. Um, I don't know if you'd had any sort of closing words that you wanted to, to wanted to say. Uh, just that it's been really good to see what you've been able to achieve very quickly. So I think we've taken, although the changes were quite small, we've actually made a big difference in terms of the accessibility with limited controls and without affecting the gameplay in any way, I don't think. No, brilliant. Sorry, okay. Russ, if I can just interject for a second. I'm sure. not sure if we showed the, um, the accessibility menu with the colorblind controls, or did you already show that? Uh, we didn't show that straight away. Um, yeah, I could show that now, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. So, do you want to talk us through it, and I'll just uh, guide yeah, you. Yeah, sure. So, if you if you open up the the main menu that you yeah. can access and go to the settings tab, you'll see there's a whole tab we've got there for accessibility options. Um, and one of the options there is actually to simulate a few different types of color blindness. Um, so you can change the colorblind mode through three different types, and you can also change the strength slider as well to simulate different severities of colorblindness. Can um, I just interject slightly, Adam? Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, just wording is is important here. So the colorblind settings do some kind of correction of colorblindness. So this is like in Fortnite, it will push colors further away. So red and green will get pushed to different colors to, to help with colorblindness rather than simulating Oh, I see. Sorry. I think I misunderstood that menu. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've also talked about simulating colorblindness at other times. Ah, okay. Um, and the two things are mathematically very similar, but the result is the opposite. Okay. So this is the opposite of simulating colorblindness, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you say the, the options okay. are there. And again, as I say, like before, th this has always been sort of really crucial to creative development. And we've always been... Uh, really keen to make sure that we're doing the right things and making it as accessible as possible. Obviously, we didn't want to just make a game that um, was accessible to play, but also the creation side as well. Uh, it was super important that that became just as you know, just as vital to the, the whole process. Uh, so things like here as well, in just in the editor itself, uh, we can do um, sort of larger toolbars. We can make sure that all the the buttons have labels on, not just like an icon. Um, we can sort of change the editor scale and kind of make it all sort of fit slightly larger in the screen. Uh, there's all sorts of things around that that we can do um, that, you know, that have been really important to the process. Um, okay, brilliant. All right, well, thank you very much again, Kirsty, and thanks to Nat and Becky earlier for joining us. Um, and once again, thank you, Adam, for helping. Cool, thank you. No Cheers. problem. Okay, cool. So um, that's been um, sort of a bit of a whistle-stop tour through uh, the um, sort of accessibility features of Crater and how uh, you can make your own games accessible. So yeah, we had a little bit of a, a scrap there with some of the scripts, but again, as I say, that's just kind of the, the beauty of game development and especially the power of Crater and that it's really up to you um, how you use those things. So um, even though we're using default built-in packages, there's nothing stopping you writing your own prompts packages and doing your own UI um, and really just kind of uh, making your own games as accessible but still as great fun as possible uh, so to close out the video uh, we're just going to play the um the showcase that we released yesterday uh, but if you haven't already seen that make sure you do subscribe to our youtube channel uh, we've got all sorts of content planned uh, in the run-up to our launch um this summer so um again big thank you to everybody who's been in the chat and i can see the mods have been busy again which has been really uh, great and exciting so if you do have any questions uh, that didn't get answered um do make sure you head over to our discord as well uh, there'll be links around in the chat or on the end cards uh, we're always there doing our best to make sure we can answer as many questions as possible uh, so yep yeah, once again thank you very much and uh, we'll see you in the next stream Hi everybody, thanks for joining us again on another of our behind the scenes videos for Crater. Here at Unit 2 Games we're really passionate about making games as accessible as possible. We've worked really hard to build a game that all experience and ability levels can enjoy playing and creating in, but we also want to do everything we can to open up the world of gaming even further to those who aren't always able to join in at all. So to celebrate this year's Global Accessibility Awareness Day, we're delighted to welcome Kirsty McNaught, our
our accessibility consultant to explain why this area is so important for so many people and how she's helped us to build Crater with accessibility needs in mind. Hi there, <laughs> Kirsty. Thanks for joining us. Do you want to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit more about your experience and the kind of projects that you get involved with? Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, so I work as an technology consultant. I specialise in game accessibility and in particular most of what I've done is on motor accessibility. So this is about how you might adapt gameplay to di either a different input mode, so maybe someone's using eye control instead of a controller, or maybe just a limited subset of controls. So maybe somebody needs fewer switches or different adaptive switches to play the game. And thinking about how you might adapt a game and the mechanics and the control systems so that you can reach as many people as possible. I first got into game accessibility by doing some work with Special Effect, the leading disabled gaming charity in, in the UK, and I worked with them a few years ago to build an eye-controlled interface for Minecraft, so both adapting the game and adapting the control inputs so that you play Minecraft using only your eyes. And since then I've worked further both in terms of eye gaze as, as an input, eye control for games, and also adapting games and uh, making them as accessible as possible. Um, so what's your involvement been so far with Crater? So I've been working with Unit 2 um, in an advisory role from quite early on in the project, uh, advising on both the accessibility of Crater the game engine and any games that will be available on Crater at launch. So my input mainly goes in via the UX side of the team, uh, because accessibility is quite a big part of user experience design. Great, and how did you get involved with Creator Sprintly? So that's one of the um, one of our indie funder games um, that's actually included some accessibility functions. Yeah, so when the indie fund call was put out, uh, Johnny put forward this proposal for Creator Sprint League, and he specifically talked about accessibility and wanting a game that could naturally target different levels of input restriction. So maybe some people would be playing with a full controller, but some people might only be able to do one joystick and, and a switch as well, or maybe someone wants to play with a single switch. Um, and I was really excited to see what Johnny was envisioning doing within Crater. Um, I was already aware of Johnny's previous project, the Bubbles the Cat platformer, which is a fantastic uh, showcase of how you can make a really engaging and rich game with interesting gameplay, um, but with really limited input restrictions, so it's a single switch platformer. Johnny was really keen from the outset to aim for a mode of the game that you'd be able to play with a single switch, much like his, uh, his platform game he'd previously designed. So while Johnny was working in Crater and building these lovely levels and doing all the level design, um, I looked at implementing a steering control algorithm, so allowing the player to be automatically steered towards or along a path defined in the environment so that they could play the game uh, using only a single switch for jumping. And one of the nice things about Johnny's game is that the, and the, the level design around that, that is that there's a lot of different options. Maybe you're going through a particular path in the level and you miss the jump and now you've got to find a different route. Um, so there was a lot of work doing uh, algorithms in Lua to help steer the player and recover from situations where you miss a jump and now you've got to go a different way. So you've worked on quite a range of different games um, projects over the years and different game development environments. How have you found working in Creator from an accessibility standpoint and, and how, how easy did you find it to, to add in, in this case, some of the Lua scripting you needed to do um, to get some of those adapts to work? So one of the nice things is that Creator takes care of a lot of low-level details for you. So you can quite quickly jump into high-level gameplay ideas and quickly iterate and explore different accessibility options. You don't need to spend time thinking about how you're going to remap controls or support a controller in a keyboard and mouse because Creator takes care of all of that for you. Um, so you can draw attention on how you're going to adapt the gameplay and using the Lua A, there's a lot of flexibility there in what you can achieve. And also in terms of game action, the collaborative aspect of Creator means that you can easily work within a team of different people taking on different parts of the game. So you might have one person on the team using a, a piece, working on it with a keyboard and mouse, jumping into advanced edit mode, implementing lots of uh, advanced stuff in Lua, while others might stay in basic mode with a controller, crafting the, the levels of your game or the environment. 
So this should make the game creation process much more approachable to everyone and hopefully more accessible. So if you're playing with the limited set of controls, you should still be able to participate in the process of building the game. And that's also something that we're hoping to get feedback from the community on so that over time we can do as much as we can to make game creation accessible to as many people as possible. And obviously we're hoping that many more people are going to be making games than ever before once Creators out. Um, what are your top tips for people that are considering accessibility issues in their game designs? So firstly, there are a huge range of game accessibility considerations, so I can't mention all of them. Um, but the way I like to think about it is to, as a game designer, put myself in the position of a player and think about two things. One, how does the player interact with your game? So is it possible that you might be able to simplify the controls or make them a bit more forgiving if you're building an environment where somebody has to move some objects in order to solve a puzzle or they need to pull a lever or press a button? Can you make sure that that doesn't require really accurate control with tiny trigger boxes, make things a little bit more forgiving? But also, how does the game communicate to, your, to the player? So if you're presenting information about the state of the world, Maybe you've got some sound effects that are signifying that there's a dangerous situation in the game. Can you make sure that you're also backing that up with visual effects so that a deaf player is not going to be missing out on some vital part of the game and vice versa if you've got something, some information being portrayed visually? Um, how are you going to back that up with other sensory modalities for somebody playing your game with visual impairment? Great, that's brilliant tips. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, huge thank you to you again for joining us today. Um, if any of you watching are interested in finding out more about accessibility issues in games, or you know of someone that would benefit from some help and support, then please check out specialeffect.org.uk. And in the meantime, check out the Creator Showcase video for Creator Sprint League as well to see some of these accessibility functions in action. Um, and keep an eye out on our channel for release date announcements soon so that you can start making your own games.